Yes, I want to say, does anybody have an idea for an incentive program for coming on time? Okay. Lord, we want to worship and glorify you. We want to bless your name. Lord, we want to honor you. Lord, I don't mind saying we are hungry for a full outpouring of your spirit. Hungry to be in your presence. Hungry to know you better. Lord Jesus, come take hold of us today. Let the distractions fall away, O oh God. Let us focus our heart, our mind, our will, our strength on you. Lord, let us enter into your presence and honor your throne. Grace upon grace, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord.
come from every rooftop sing. For now I know that God is for me, not against me.
says, will you take me at my word? Yes, we'll take you at your word. Looks like tonight the sky. 
yes, I'm ready to dance upon this barren land, hope in my hands. Cause it's living water we desire, fill our hearts with holy fire.
how to sing it Let a song rise from your own heart Shed him another song in your dress Shed him another heavens are open Shed him another song in your dress like he said, I want you to sing this song to me. And it kind of surprised me because it's an old hymn. And uh, so Jesus, we want to sing this to you, Lord, by your request. Thank you, Jesus.
Lord, you wreck me. You just wreck me. And the tears, man. I can't even find the song, God. <laughs> I can't find it. Falter, the Father comes. 
reach out and lay a hand on the person next to you. If you're not close to somebody, scoop close, but just lay your hand on them. Lord, we invite your healing to flow through this body right now. Your healing anointing to flow through this body. Lord, your healing oil to pour down over us. Touching wounded hearts, Lord, touching broken bodies, touching sickness. Lord, in your kingdom there are no tears, there's no suffering, no crying, no darkness. And Lord, we stand in your presence right now. We stand in your presence. Let that oil flow, Jesus, we cry. Let every manifestation of darkness be banished from this room now. In the name of Jesus. In the presence of the living God. Thank you, Jesus. One of the things I know from Scripture is that the way the Greek reads, it isn't the healers that are appointed in the body of Christ. It's, it's the healings themselves. They belong to all of us. Not to the superstar on the stage, but they belong to all of us. And so, Lord, we come before you as a people and we own this. We own this. We receive this. We take it, Lord. We, and we believe it. And we choose it. In Jesus' name. Too loud, too loud. I'm wrecked. I don't know about anybody else, but I am wrecked. Oh, Jesus. And since I'm wrecked, where's my son? <laughs> okay. This is still on the verge of feedback. You want to pull it back just a little bit, please? going to give away a thing, yeah. Okay. Right, like right now? Or are like, you going to wait? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm still wrecked. It's okay. your show. <laughs> All right. Since, since he's a mess, <laughs> let's pray. <laughs> Good that idea. Sound? <laughs> Lord, you're awesome. Well, I thank you that you're not confused and you're not tired and you're not frustrated. I thank you, Lord, that you're in a good mood. God, I thank you that you're not worried. I thank you that you're not concerned. I thank you that you're in control. And Lord, we give everything over to you right now. Every worry, every concern, every pain, every question. We surrender it right now to you. And in Jesus' name, on this whole congregation, we lift it up and we give it over to our God. We say, here, take this. Take it all. Lord, I ask there wouldn't be one person left in this room by the end of this service that doesn't feel light, that doesn't feel free, and that is wearing only your yoke when they leave here. So Lord, we give all this over to you. We thank you and we praise you that you're our God and that everything is already done and we are already in heavenly places. We thank you. We're already with you. So we surrender striving 
we surrender everything, that we would stay in your peace and never leave it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So, do we have any new people? For As first in, time. first time in the church <laughs> this morning. See, there's Thumper. He's new every week. I don't know what it is with him. So, so put your hand put up your hand. in the air. Someone will give you five. <laughs> hey, there we go. See, <laughs> you got five. That's awesome. God is doing a new thing. <laughs> In yeah, there is a, he always forgets. There's a card in that booklet. You fill it oh, out, yeah. take it to the desk in the foyer. We have a free worship CD for you, so don't, don't miss that. Yes, <laughs> we do. Okay. <laughs> Are we taking the offering before the... Yeah, we always thing? take the offering now. So There's we're... three things I had to say that God commanded me in the name of Jesus to say before the offering. The first one, and you may have heard this before, is that wherever you go, that is where you are. <laughs> the second thing is, and this is especially for the young people in the room, is that if you're listening to music and it sounds bad, it probably is. <laughs> the third thing, and this is for the Alpharin specifically, <laughs> is that if you make change in the offering bag, you might be a redneck. Okay, <laughs> so Lord, <laughs> bless the offering and any rednecks that may be giving to it. Thank you, Jesus. Let's roll the video. <laughs> Needed as soon as possible. Two nursery workers for just the third Sunday of every month in the morning. Call the church office or talk to Pastor Beth if you can help with this delightful ministry. A Healing Encounter weekend is coming up. The dates are Friday and Saturday, August 1 and 2. Overcome issues that hold you back in life and faith. Grow in the Lord, cleanse the heart, and become more whole. Check your bulletin for all the information and sign up in the foyer this week and next. The Father comes. And the next meeting of the Dream Team, Training and Dream Interpretation for Outreach, is this Thursday at 7 o'clock. This is not a closed group. You can still come. A bit lost here. 19 youth and leaders are leaving this week for the Fascinate High School Youth Conference at the International House of Prayer. Pray for them. Pray for revival. Here's a news flash. A firm offer for our building has been received from a Spanish congregation appropriate to the demographic of this neighborhood. And we're waiting details of the proposal in writing. This is the first step toward moving to a more advantageous location for our ministries. Our board will soon be considering the details and making a decision. This focuses the issue of finding a place to move to. New Song needs a major miracle to accomplish this. Rest assured that we will not close on the sale of this building without having found a suitable facility to move to. Obviously, this is a time for us to press forward in the Lord, to renew our dedication to praying together, to expect great things of God, and to cultivate faithfulness. We'll be moving up in the Holy Spirit, in strategic location, and in growth. It's a time for hope. So, how do men exercise at the beach? By sucking in their stomach whenever they see a bikini. I thought that was a good summer joke. Give me a break. <laughs> we have a prize to give away. Okay, we have the American Patriots Bible. Yes. Not sure what that means exactly. <laughs> but there it is. And we have a few names in here. How do these names get in here? People went in the bookstore, signed up. Oh, registered. Okay, cool. So here we go. Oh, Snoof! Snoof! 
Pretty good. Snoop cool. wins. <laughs> Whose real name yes. is Bobby Brazel, okay? So this Robert <laughs> Brazel. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And this is Mission Sunday, so we need that mic back. Hear me. Okay. Thank you. I would like to have Sue Stone come up here, please. Oh. Patty, Patty Rivet. Dennis Mumford, are you in here? Come up, please. Art, I don't know if you're available. I don't know if Art can make it up here or not. No? Nope. Okay, that figures. Donna Lennerson, are you in the house? I saw her earlier. Come up here, please. Thank you. I just, uh, I've been led by the Lord to, uh, just show some appreciation for some of these here. Uh, Sue Stone, this is a certificate of appreciation for you. She is our oldest volunteer. She comes in faithfully on Wednesdays. She goes to Sam's and picks up tortillas and rolls out, helps us roll out what, about 200 burritos every Wednesday to take to the homeless. So we, we, we appreciate you, Sue. Thank you so much. Um, Jim. Would you run this to Art for me, please? And this is for Art. Uh, Art, would you stand up, please? He's back there at the video In recognition station. of his He doesn't want to stand up. He's shaking his head. As the volunteer leader with the food bank and building maintenance. Many of you don't know that, but he also does a lot of stuff around the building for us. Thank you, Art. We love you, brother. That, that either means Donna, thank him when it's fixed or blame him when it isn't. It's appreciation so for all that you do as well. Let me, let me see that one time. Everybody knows Donna? Okay, um, God's Closet, the, the clothing bank, God's Warehouse, our furniture bank, and many other things that we have that we give out, beds, couches, uh, you name it. And cleaning as well, many areas of our building that she just doesn't get noticed for, but she's constantly at it. Thank you, Donna. We appreciate you. And Dennis. Boy, this is gonna make me cry. Eight years as our volunteer leader in the kitchen and chef in the Lighthouse Cafe. Eight years. Yeah. 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 Woo. Woo. Thank you, Dennis. And last but not least, Patty Rivet. Woo. Rivet. Rivet. <laughs> Rivet. <laughs> I'm always thinking of the rivets. How many of you know the rivets? <laughs> Patty Rivet. OK. Outstanding service as our volunteer leader of the NOAA ministry. I don't know how many of you know it, it's been about what now? Six years. Six years faithfully. Yeah. Thank you, that's, that's no one allowed homeless or hungry for those who don't know. Yeah, that's awesome. And honorable mention to Ann Himes, who's been, and stand up, her right hand for those six years. Thank you, Ann. And all, all the others that volunteer on a regular basis with all these ministries. Thank you. We appreciate you. Couldn't do it without you. Iris, you have some. Uh, Slides, um, I don't know how many of you know, but we, we have our food bank now established. There's all our, our boxes that come in. Art, again, and his team, including Galen. Brother Galen, bring those in, uh, tw tw sometimes twice a week. And then, go ahead, another slide. After Sunday, when they hand out the product for the food bank, they restock the shelves. So that's after they restocked, and that's what comes in as a result of your giving. That's another one of the shelves. Go ahead, Iris. Another slide, please. An another shelf with all the beverages. So as you see, there's a lot of product that's available. And uh, another slide. And there's, there's our watchdog. So no messing around. Yeah, beware of the vicious dog. OK. <laughs> he's guarding the, the freezer room. And that's where we have all the meats. You know where he's at. And that's okay. all there is. So yeah. Thank you all. Amen? <laughs> so I want to show the food bank because um, I was going to ask, you know, like you're taking your tithes or anything like that, but if you consider in your offering to give or to donate to the food bank, okay? We're going to need to beef up our funds there. Um, it costs us on an average $50, $60 every time they go out, which like I said is about two times a, a week. And we get on an average about five, sometimes $10 a week in offerings for that. So. If you could help us offset that a little bit, we would appreciate it. Thank you all. All right.
Ah, I think I have it together now. Sort of. Except that when you wear contact lenses and you've been crying, then you get yellow halos around all the lights. Anyway. High school youth, that way. Middle schoolers, follow the waving hand in the back. All right. Before I get this sermon started, you know, pastors generally hate to pre preach their best stuff in the middle of the summer because they know that people are on vacation, like today. There are about 20, 21 young adults that are up in the mountains camping. We bless them where they are. And uh, next week, what is 19 youth uh, and leaders? 14, 19 yeah, five leaders, 14 youth going to IHOP. Man, I want to see them come back lit. And then I want to see him torch you. <laughs> so, this is one of those messages that I wanted to preach. And, you know, I wanted to preach with a lot of people here, but the Lord said, No, you got to preach it today. So, are you ready? Jesus, come. Fill this word. Lord, craft our atmosphere for us. Fill our hearts. Prepare us to hear. Lord, prepare us to come closer to you. Prepare us, Lord, to receive a multitude. A multitude. Prepare our atmosphere to receive a multitude. Those who need you. Those who are at the end of themselves. Lord, those who are ready for a different way. Thank you, Lord. How do you come up out of the pit after a season of darkness or after a season of discouragement? You know those times when the heaviness gets on you and it seems to sap the hope out of your heart until there's, you, know, you just want to die. You, know, you want to quit. You want to roll over and, and, and quit. It's kind of like sometimes the train has been parked at the station for so long that it's begun to rust and gather cobwebs, and now it's time to move, and the, 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 the train's begun to move, but your spiritual and emotional muscles have now atrophied, and you're having trouble making your body move to, 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 or even believe that the train is leaving the station, and you need to be on it. So what does God say about that? What's the solution to that? Hebrews 10, starting at verse 23, for those that have your Bibles. If you don't, you can cheat. It's up on the screen. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. So the first thing that the apostle tells us to do is to hold on to the truth. Hold on for dear life. Choose to hope. No matter what comes against you, he says, choose to hope. It's not easy, and you're going to need the kind of help that comes up in the words that follows. Because I can't do it alone, you can't do it alone, and that's part of the message of this passage. We have to have each other to hang on to the hope. And he, the second part of that says, for he who is promised is faithful. No matter how it looks, no matter how long it's been, God will come through. End of story. He will. And here's the help you need. Verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, a lot of pastors will preach that, and it's kind of the legalistic club they beat you with, you know. Like, you must be in church on Sunday. God commands it. That's not the point. The point's that we need each other. The point is that we need to be encouraging one another. And we need to be doing more and more of it as we see the day of the Lord approaching. We need to stimulate one another. We need to strengthen one another. And the apostle knew what he was talking about. Because the people that he wrote to had been through the ringer. They'd been through harder times than you and I have ever imagined. They'd been battered. Their hope was under assault. Here's what it was like, starting at verse 32, same chapter, chapter 10. But remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings.
partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. In other words, their reputations were slandered, and they were hated for their faith. Can you imagine? I mean, you know, we get a little bit of that today, but can you imagine living in a community where everybody around you hates you? That's where they were. Verse 34. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners. In other words, some of them have been thrown into jail and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. Oh, goody, my house got foreclosed on. Oh, goody, they, they took my property just because... This is what they, happened to them. They took my property just because I was a believer. Oh, joy. And I go, eh? Knowing that you have, you, you accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. So their property had been seized and confiscated, and they were reduced to poverty. Verse 35, therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Why does he say that? He said that, see, the apostle never says anything in a vacuum. He said this because they were beginning to question. They'd been under so much pressure for so long. They were beginning to doubt, maybe even question their faith. They were beginning to wonder if, if God was really with them and is it all really true? And if it was true, then why is all this coming down on us? If God loves me, why is this happening to me? You've said that. I've heard you say it. Verse 36, for you have need of endurance so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. So now he says, God is good for his promise, he's coming. Not too different than saying to you and me, hold on and get ready, because a new outpouring of the Spirit is about to break. It's about to happen. So hold on. But because of the pressure that they'd been under, because of the hurt of all the setbacks and delays, they were beginning to have a hard time hanging on to hope. I know what's happened to a lot of people in these last few years. And I said to Beth the other day, this is getting to be ridiculous. I'm tired of going to the hospital and visiting people who are deathly ill over and over again. Father, hold on. They were having a hard time hanging on to hope. And so the solution that the apostle gave was twofold. It's really two sides of the same thing. Here's the first one. Stimulate one another to love and good deeds. In other words, keep on doing good. Keep on serving. Help one another to do it. Don't stop. Walk together in it, because if you quit, you're lost. Don't surrender. Here's the second one, and this is even more important in a time of heaviness and, and hurt and assault on hope, especially when it's time to come up out of it, encourage one another. Just encourage one another. And here's the first principle. When you're down, you all know this, when you get down and you get discouraged and you get depressed, your first instinct is to go isolate someplace, isn't it? I'm going to pull away, I'm going to stay home, and I'm going to nurse my wounds and watch sad movies and listen to sad music or something like that. And so you tend to isolate from everybody. That only makes it worse. It only makes it worse. And it lets everybody else down, those people who need you and love you just as much as you need them. Life comes in connection with others. We're in this together. It's not just attend, not just, not just attend church for the sake of attending church. It's to be there no matter how you feel and be there for your brothers and sisters because they're feeling just like you. And so we feed each other. We strengthen each other. We're in this together. I've been around recovering people in 12-step treatment programs for most of my career. Less in Denver than in the church I was in before, but I worked with treatment centers there. and I, they, they, I, was, I was the pastor that they called in at the end of the, of the, the first phase, which is the first five steps. I was the pastor that called in, so I know what it's about. And here's what I know. Every recovering person in a 12-step program knows that in order to stay on top of addiction, you need to be with others who are sharing their experience, their strength, and their hope with one another. 
Because if you don't have that, you're going down. They know that. The problem with the rest of us sinners is we don't know that. And we need to know that. Because it's the way up. In other words, what you're doing is you're choosing to focus beyond yourself and you're investing in the lives of others and that's what imparts the strength for you to stand. Because they're investing in you too. It means that their struggle is yours. And their victories are yours too because their struggle was yours. This is what the Apostle's talking about. Consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. You need one another. And he's, and he's speaking this in the context of hurt and discouragement and beginning to wonder, is Jesus ever going to keep the promise? See, it's, this is the law of the kingdom that I'm talking about, and it works. It's the principle that if you're sacrificing yourself for the sake of the kingdom, which means you're invested in other people, then you find your life, and if you don't, you lose it. Jesus said this several times in several ways. Here's Matthew 16, 25. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Mark 8, 35. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Luke 9, 24. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. And with Jesus, that's always an investment in people. It's always a connection, a relational connection. Matthew 23, 11, But the greatest among you shall be your servant. And he says things like that again and again and again and again. And a key element of that connection is encouragement. Simple encouragement. We're cre creating an atmosphere of encouragement. So that when people walk into our midst, there's encouragement, there's uplift. There's something that's the, the counteracting influence to the heaviness that people increasingly carry in this culture in which we live. Now, there are wrong ways and there are right ways to give people encouragement. And I've experienced most of them. You can take, you can take the argumentative approach which means somebody comes to you and they say, you know, I'm just, life is worthless and empty and there's so much coming against me and I'm so sad and God's not doing anything. And you can argue with them. You can say, well, that's not true. Look at what God's doing in your life. Look at this. Look at that. Or you can do what they did way back in the early days of the charismatic renewal. You come to somebody depressed and they'd say, well, just praise God more, brother. Just praise God more. Because there's power and praise, and then they give you books to read. And that was a period when I was deeply depressed. And people would come to me, we just praise God, brother. If you don't praise God, God can't do anything for you. Oh, good, that was really encouraging. That was so helpful. <laughs> it just made things worse. Because the, the message it sent was, I didn't hear you. I didn't listen to your heart. And I'm up here, and you're down there. And I just want you to perform. So you missed it. And it was really hard because I'm, you know, part of, I'm part of the family that pioneered inner healing, you know, supposed to know how to fix people. And so I'm deep in depression way back then. And, my, and what I got from my family, not from my wife, but what I got from my family was, you just shouldn't feel that way. That's not real. It's just not like that. And it left me alone with nothing to hold on to. This is not what I'm talking about. See, I just felt condemned for not being able to be up and positive. It was like someone was telling me, if I didn't feel the right things, then God couldn't bless me. God couldn't do anything for me. It drove me deeper into despair. Because how many of you know, you can't just go into your closet and flip the breaker on your emotions and be different. It doesn't work that way, does it? Oh, I'm supposed to feel something different. Ugh! won't happen. The kind of encouragement that works, the kind of encouragement that God gives, does something like what the apostle was trying to do when he wrote the Hebrews. Listen, here's the first piece. He was reminding them of their identity. He was reminding them, this is who you are. 
It's what the apostle said to the Hebrews in a time of heaviness. He said things like this, you endured. Well, that's positive, isn't it? That's affirming of who you are. It's not telling you what you're not doing. You endured. And then he said, you showed sympathy to the prisoners. See, now, this is who you are. This is what I see in you. This is positive. I'm not asking you to perform. I'm just telling you what I see. You have for yourselves a better possession, he said. Reminding them, this is what you have. It's like he was saying, I know who you are. Remember who you are. Don't forget who you are. You're stronger than you think. See the love you carry? Don't let these circumstances rob you of any of that. Paul reminded Timothy. Timothy was his spiritual son. If you read First and Second Timothy, you find out that Timothy was sick a lot. People were criticizing him for being young. They weren't listening to him. He was weak. He was discouraged. When I read between the lines, I know what Timothy was feeling. He wanted to quit. And so Paul, as his spiritual father, comes to lift him up. And here's what he says, Second Timothy. This isn't up on the screen, so you don't get to cheat, but 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, 6 and 7. I am mindful of the sincere faith within you. What's he doing? He says, this is what I see. I know who you are. Which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I'm sure that it is in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. What's he doing? He's reminding him of his gifting. He's reminding him what's, what's in him. I could go through this congregation and I could point at these two in the second row and say, you got a healing gift, whether you believe it or not. And I'm not asking them to perform. I'm just reminding them who they are. You know? Joanne got a mission heart. That's not going to go away. <laughs> it's time to pick it up. I could go through the congregation and do that one after another. One after another. Not asking you to perform. This is what's in you. You're hurting, oppressed, depressed. This is what's in you. Kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He goes on to say in verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Timothy, remember who you are. Get up and walk with it. See, there's, he's giving encouragement in the face of discouragement and heaviness. There was a time, I've told bits of this story before, but there was a time when I was on a church staff where I really didn't fit and everybody was against me. My words, anything I said was twisted and then passed around, getting more twisted as it went. Nothing I had to contribute was valued or honored. Lies were told about me. There was mocking, there was criticism, and there were, lie, there were distortions. And I fell into deep depression and darkness and hopelessness. And at that point, a young woman appeared at the door of my office. She was not a great saint. As a matter of fact, she had mental problems. And she suffered depression and delusions. She was on medication to control it all, full of hurt and hopelessness all by herself. But there she was, standing in the door of my office, and out of her mouth came, you're a thoroughbred, don't let these people take that from you, get up and run. Now that's why we need each other. That was encouragement. And it helped me get through a difficult time. And so I stood up inside myself, and I didn't necessarily get over the depression. That went on for a while. And I didn't get over the discouragement, but it gave me a measure of strength that I needed to stand up just when I wanted to quit and die. That's why we don't forsake our own assembling together. The apostle cried out that we not isolate when we feel that way. Stop forsaking our own assembling together but encouraging one another. I can't do that if I'm not present to do it. If I'm not there to be drawn out of my own stuff to invest in you, then there's no encouragement. 
And part of, the, part of the dynamic there is encouragement is best done if I know you. You know, if I know what the target is, I have a better chance of hitting it, don't I? Really. It's best done if I know you. And you can receive it better if you know that I know you. If you know that I'm carrying you in my heart, you can receive it better. I keep getting emails from a crazy prophet guy that thinks he's, his job is to correct all of us prophets who are well known. I tried once to say, you don't know us. You don't know what we're about. You have no authority to speak. He called me arrogant. Now he writes me every day. <laughs> and it goes directly to my trash file. I don't even read them. For obvious reasons. Encouragement is best done if I know you. Timothy was a spiritual son to Paul. They'd walk together closely, and so there was love between them. So Paul could speak in a way that Timothy could hear. He could speak accurately. See, if I've listened to you and I've understood you, and I've, I've, I've experienced who you are, and I've seen your gifts, and I've seen your nature, that's when I can best lift you up by my words. That's why it's not just about Sundays. It's, it's the gatherings for corporate prayer. You know, if I can hear somebody pray, I can know what kind of person you are because I'll hear your heart. It's the times we gather for corporate prayer. It's our river groups. Celebrate recovery. People who come for lunch on Wednesday and sit down and just talk together over, over the food as we're eating that free lunch with Noah on Wednesday. Any number of other times when we come together in relationship and just share our lives. I had the picnic yesterday. It was a smaller picnic than usual because we had 20-some young adults up in the mountains and people were pretty sure it was going to rain. And it did. <laughs> that was a fulfilled prophecy. <laughs> but we're in under the canopy and people, you know, was, we had no program. We didn't even set up the volleyball net. I just walked around, saw people visiting with each other, having a good time, getting to know one another. And you know what? It was sweet. And it was encouragement. It was relationship. We share our lives. And when we can share our lives, then we can speak encouragement in a way that goes to the target. Second element of encouragement is reminding one another of the truth of God's promises. Chapter 10, verse 36, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For in yet a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. You know, part of the heaviness we experience, it happens because sometimes the promise takes a while. You figure that out yet? It's not the drive up at Burger King. It takes a while. That was the problem for the Hebrews in this passage. It was taking a long time. You see, it says, so you have need of endurance. God promised you a blessing. He did, and it's going to come. And if I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to remind you that that blessing is coming. I mean, re <laughs> repeatedly I'm going to remind you. I remember a couple in our church, they know who they are, who were childless after years of marriage, and they were discouraged and depressed and brokenhearted. I saw their tears. Part of encouraging them was reminding them that the promise is secure. It wasn't long after that. I had a word of knowledge on a Sunday morning that we needed to pray for couples you know, that have barren wombs. We needed to pray for the opening of barren wombs. And we prayed over several couples that morning. By, by, I won't tell, they could tell you who they are. I won't tell you. But by their own calculations, they probably got pregnant that night. Now they have two beautiful children. <laughs> because God is good for His promise. He is. It just takes longer than we want to believe. God will deliver it, but there might be delay, and delay can steal your hope. Abraham and Sarah waited for Isaac to be born until she was well past 90. He was over 100. And more than once, Abraham despaired of having a son by Sarah. Genesis 15, 3 and 4, Abraham said, Since you've given no offspring to me, he's talking to God, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man, he was talking about this other guy was going to inherit, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. 
And he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to to him, so shall your descendants be. Repeatedly after that moment, God encouraging Abraham repeated that promise. And each time he made it bigger. Go read it. Each time it was bigger. He added things like, You'll be, in you, all the nations of the earth will get a blessing. Not just you're going to have all kinds of descendants, but the nations of the earth will get a blessing through them. See, that's encouragement. You're being reminded of the promise. It's real. Affirming it. I'm getting tested in that right now. (laughs) It had to be 10 years ago or more that the prophecy was spoken over this church. That God was going to give us a new facility, bigger, with parking, 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 visible for the multitudes that would come for the Miracle Center. Ten, twelve years later, I'm thinking, well, (laughs) you know, my heart begins to quail. And then two years ago, two leading prophetic voices say, 2014 is a really big deal for you guys. Two years of preparation, then 2014, big deal for you guys. Well, this is the year I got a new book coming out. This is the year that, um, as a matter of fact, if you want a copy of July's issue of Charisma Magazine with my feature article in it, I have two copies. They sent me three. I got two copies. I'll give it to you. First two that come to me after service. After service. <laughs> after service. And then, for the first time, we get a firm offer on this building. And you know what it is? This little church has a benefactor that's buying the church for them. He'll write a million dollar check. So now I'm standing before the Lord saying, okay, Lord, we need about three or four times that much so that we can move. But it looks to me like the promise has been set in motion after all this time. Sometimes it takes a while. And so you affirm the promise, and you stand on the promise. How many times, if you go read 1 Samuel, how many times did barren Hannah come to the altar every year, every year, to weep and cry because she had no child? And finally, Samuel was conceived, who became the great prophet. God delivers his promise. My parents, they became the pioneers of inner healing, known the world over. I've lost count of how many books have been written between my father and my mother. I mean, I think I stopped counting at 17. There's not one inner healing ministry anywhere in the world that I know of that doesn't credit their foundation to my parents. But you know how they started? They pastored little churches in tiny towns, little churches of 60 to 80 people in obscure tiny towns for 21 years before God brought that promise to pass. And so here's what I'm saying. Speak the promise. Remind one another of the promise of God over each of your lives. Remind one another of the promise of God for this church. Another piece is we need, here's another piece of this encouragement I'm talking about. We need to create together an atmosphere of positive praise to God. That makes it a place that celebrates and speaks of who God is. How many of us would stay very long in a group of people who spoke only about negatives? We're going to have a new river group in the church. We'll call it the grumblers. <laughs> and you're not allowed to come unless you have something to piss about. I mean, who'd sign up? Some of you would. You're just lying. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really. People, it's the atmosphere of uplift that contributes to encouragement, isn't it? And the the atmosphere of uplift that contributes to encouragement is fed by consistent praise of God, by seeking to see what God is doing and then remembering what He's done in the past. Some of us have really short memories. How many times do you have to get rescued before you get the point? Remembering what He's done in the past and making certain that we speak of that to one another. There's a principle in Scripture that sacrifice releases power for blessing and victory. That's the law. That's the way reality works. 
But probably the most primary sacrifice the New Testament Christian can offer is the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. It's the one that most feeds the relationship with God. It's the one that keeps us centered on Jesus. It's the one that most keeps relationships between believers clean. It's the one that most builds and feeds faith. And it's the one that we're most easily seduced away from because ever since Adam we have a bent toward the negative. Hebrews 13, verses 15 and 16. Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Psalm 22, 3. You are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Psalm 50, verse 23, He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me, and to him who orders his way aright, I will show the salvation of God. Offer up the, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and God will reveal to you what he's been doing all along. Power released in sacrifice Power released in the sacrifice of praise is the first and foremost sacrifice we New Testament Christians are called to offer. It doesn't just please God. It creates an atmosphere of positivity and encouragement. It's an atmosphere of hope. So take another look at Hebrews 10.24. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. To consider something means to spend time thinking about it. You're turning it over in your heart. You're pondering it. You're working with it in your mind and in your heart. Whatever, whatever you spend time considering, pondering, and working on in your mind and in your heart will sooner or later come out of your mouth and it'll affect others. Because the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. As a general rule, the enemy of our soul sees what we've set as a goal and he moves to stop it because he knows that if we succeed then power will flow from heaven and so setbacks come, opposition comes. God never promised us that wouldn't happen. Primary resistance to that involves considering how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Feeding one another on the encouragement that strengthens us to do that. And so you look for the God things in the lives of others. You speak those things into them. We, we direct our hearts and minds to consider these things because if we do, then those positive things will come out of our mouth and we'll affirm and lift others. Feed the hope. If I'm going to stimulate my brother or sister to love more deeply and keep on doing good through encouragement, I'm going to have to call out the best. I'm going to have to see it. Identify it and say it. And again, it's like I see a gift of prayer on some of you who've laid it down, but I've seen it. Gift of healing on some of you who haven't been doing it, but I see it. I see gifts of prophecy on some who've closed their mouths. I see a compassion on a whole group of us. And so I want to consider, I want to think about ways that I can confirm, that I can affirm and, and activate that. We do that for one another. It's not just my job. It's, that's what a body of Christ does. That's what we're for. And if we don't, we're going down. How do I give encouragement and so strengthen the hand of God? Huh? Paul had it right. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. That's a whole lot like consider how to stimulate one another. Make your mind and heart look at that. So I'm talking about creating an atmosphere of praise that feeds and releases hope, feeds and releases encouragement and power not getting on brother or sister's case to perform when they're in depression, not feeding it by joining them in their depression either. 
mean, I can weep with a brother who's weeping, but I don't want him to stay there, and I don't want to stay there with him. I want to come up out of it. I'm talking about an atmosphere of positivity that highlights what God is doing without denying that there's hurt and discouragement. That's true. Weep with those who weep, but not so that they can stay there. So I'm going to work. This is my commitment. I'm going to work at focusing my heart. I'm going to work at focusing my mind and my spirit so that I'm able to do, for instance, what Paul and Silas did. I keep going back to this scripture because what they did is a mystery to my messed up heart. What they did after being beaten with rock with rods and locked in a prison, locked in the stocks, their sacrifice of praise released power that turned a discouraging defeat into a resounding victory. Get a hold of this. Acts 16, verses 25 through 27. They're locked in the stocks. Their backs are bleeding and bruised. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Now, either they're severely brain damaged and don't understand what just happened to them, or they got hold of a secret you and I need to take hold of. And the prisoners are listening to them. They're being rude. <laughs> Let us sleep, will you? Shut up. No, we're praising God. And suddenly there came a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. That's because the incentive program in those days was... If you were a guard and you let a prisoner escape, you got the punishment the prisoner was supposed to get. So he's about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. So the jailer took them home, washed their wounds, preached, and they preached the gospel to his household. The whole household got feared, filled with the Spirit and saved. And the next day, they were released. And all because even in their pain, they offered up a sacrifice of praise. I'm telling you, chains are being broken in this place right now in this season. And doors are opening right now in this season. And so it's a time. If you've been in isolation, it's a time to come out. And it's a time to renew our commitment to encourage one another, to remind one another who we are, to see what God has built in each one and to affirm it and to call it out, to rekindle gifts that we once practiced and laid down, to create, an, an, to create an atmosphere of positive hope and uplift that breaks the bondages and sets people free. Promises of God are certain. They're certain. He'll fulfill His word over you and He'll fulfill His word over us as a people. That's rock solid. And right now it's beginning to happen. That's who we're called to be as a people. And that's where we're going. And so, Father, I pray that you would, in this hour, rekindle gifts that have been laying dormant. And I pray, Lord, that those who've fallen under that blanket of oppression would come out and begin to look into the hearts of brothers and sisters and begin to share their experience and their strength and their hope begin to speak into each other, to encourage, to say, this is what I see in you and I love what I see. Because Lord, that's the heart, that you, that's, that's your Holy Spirit in us, that's your heart that you've implanted into us. So come ignite it in Jesus' name. Ministry team, specific instructions today. I want you, when you pray for people today, to see into their hearts what God has placed there and call it out. Seriously, call it out. And if you're one of those, you've been walking under a blanket of oppression and you know it, there's been that maybe a temptation in your heart to quit or there's old gifts that you haven't done because you've, you've just been under too much heaviness and you maybe felt like you couldn't move forward. Let them pray for you. Let them speak into you what they see. Can we do that? So, Lord, I just pray that that gets released today. And if you're here for the first time, we don't have an official amen here. I'm going to do one more song. We can linger in worship. 
Uh, you can leave whenever Holy Spirit releases you to leave. But ministry team, I need you to come up here with some fire in your bones and some profit in your eyeballs. See into people. You ready? And if you don't get up here, I'm coming to get you. All right? And I mean it, there's power in this house today. If you need that lift, don't waste this moment. Don't be thinking in your heart.